This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Welcome to The Writing Life. I'm Tara Hart, and I'm very honored to host a conversation today with no less than three extraordinary novelists. Now, if I were to tell the viewers about all of your accomplishments and all your books, that would take up the entire show. So I'm just going to mention a couple of your major titles, and some of those we'll discuss today. Okay. Helen Elaine Lee is the author of The Serpent's Gift, Watermarked, and your forthcoming book is Life Without. Mm -hmm. Thridi Umregar. Uh, is the author of If Today Be Sweet, Bombay Time, The Space Between Us. You have a memoir, First Darling of the Morning, and your forthcoming work is The Weight of Heaven, That's right. which I believe is just out. It's coming out next yeah. month. Yeah. Yeah. And Donna Hemmons, um, the author of River Woman, and your next book is Voices from the Sea. Right. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Um, I recently heard Sandra Cisneros interviewed on the radio. Uh, in celebration of Women's History Month, they asked her to name a woman that inspired her. And she gave three very interesting answers. She um, first named the Virgin of Guadalupe okay. and a band of indigenous grandmothers and the character RuPaul. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, as women writers, specifically, if you have any sources of inspiration you could share? Anyone? Yeah. Um, I guess I'd have to say lots of women in politics, from mm. Eleanor Roosevelt to Fannie Lou Hamer, people like that. But probably the, the person who's inspired me the most is my mother, who was mm. a literature professor and who was my, my guide into the world of books and, and literature. And so through her, I guess I got to know uh, all kind of inspirational writers. So mm -hmm. some of the women writers who've been most inspirational are Virginia, Virginia Woolf and Toni Morrison mm -hmm. and Paul Marshall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think Helen just stole my two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really alarming in some sense that uh, I was going to say Toni Morrison, um, mm -hmm. but not just because of you know, the fact that she's a brilliant writer, but also I think her work ethic. You know, I've read interviews um, with her where she's talked about, um, you know, before she had the luxury of, mm -hmm. of quitting her day job and, and being a full-time writer, mm -hmm. you know, she was juggling raising two sons, yes. um, working as an editor at Random House, mm -hmm. and still somehow making this commitment to her work. Mm -hmm. And I just find that kind of a work ethic really uh, inspiring. And I have to say Virginia Woolf, uh, uh, again, not just because she's a brilliant writer, but sort of what we know of her personal life and the demons that she battled mm -hmm. and how um, she never ultimately let that get in the way of, mm -hmm. of being a writer, which I think is really heroic, you know, yeah. and, and it's a source of inspiration. Yeah. Well, I have to say Toni Morrison as well. I mean, uh, <laughs> Beloved is my favorite book, and it's the book that inspires me. Mm. Um, but the other person or the other woman who inspires me is, is simply my mother. And um, partly because I, I write so much about mothers and daughters that mm -hmm. I think in some ways I'm trying to understand my relationship with my mother and my mother's relationship with the women in her life. And, you know, I think she has been a very strong woman who has influenced a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so I... I I admire her and what she has done. Mm, thank you. Um, Thridi, I've heard you mention that you've written books to answer a complex question for yourself. Right. Um, I wonder if all of you could speak a little bit about some of the central questions that your books address. Maybe we could start with you, Thridi. Well, as I said last night, mm. you know, one of the reasons I wrote uh, The Space Between Us is I was, I was anxious for myself to answer this question of um, when, when two women share a friendship, you know, what is the glue that holds them together? Um, I mean, clearly it's, it's the bonds of gender and shared life experience, 
But when these two women come from entirely different class backgrounds, you know, what is the role of class and caste in, in, in that? Um, so I feel like each one of my books sort of poses some central question. Uh, the most recent one, The Weight of Heaven, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a story of these two, of this young couple in their 30s who have suffered this horrible blow. Their seven-year-old son has died. Um, and yet their responses to grief are entirely different. Um, Ellie, the wife, is sort of made larger, if you will. Uh, it, it, her, her loss has opened her up to the loss of others uh, mm -hmm. and the sorrows in the world. Uh, Frank, in some ways, has shriveled up and has been made smaller mm -hmm. uh, by, by his loss. Um, and so how do different human beings and why do different human beings react so differently to the same external event? So every book comes with its own set of questions, I think. Right. That sounds like a question your work addresses, Helen. Yeah, I think, um, I think there are two, two uh, questions that, that um, preoccupy me mm -hmm. and that I'm sort of going at in everything that I write. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I've gone at, gone at them in different ways in each book, but they are how people manage to make something out of loss, mm -hmm. make art out of loss, or pull light from darkness, or you know, take difficulty and, and somehow rebirth themselves mm -hmm. you know, out, out of it. Um, and the second is the, the role of narrative in people's lives. Um, you know, what, how are we always uh, making stories about who we are and about what matters mm -hmm. to us and about our choices and our circumstances? And, and how is that a, a kind of, how are stories a kind of a lifeline and a means of survival mm -hmm. and a, a thing that binds a community together, and yeah. mm -hmm. and um, and also and and also, how are they sometimes the the story that we want and need, even if it's maybe not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, so I've you know in one book I go at that question of of narrative through uh, African American oral storytelling tradition, mm -hmm. and in another through visual art and um, and uh, kind of a. a, a a making of a family story because families do that too. You know, mm -hmm. make make these narratives yes. about who, about who they are and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what mythologies. their past is. <laughs> yes, or mythologies. And then uh, finally, in my um, latest novel, which is about uh, eleven people who are incarcerated mm -hmm. in two neighboring prisons, so much uh, is going on in inside of people's heads. Uh, also publicly, you know, in the day room at the domino table, there's a kind of presentation, a public public narrative. But I think I'm, I'm even more interested in the private narrative going through people mm -hmm. about, um, about what, what brought them to that point and, and how there might be a future. And uh, so a lot of it is about memory and mm -hmm. regret and, and sometimes um, hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's easy to start seeing the connections here. And, and your river woman, of course, ends with, uh, begins with the greatest loss. It, that it does, but um, you know, I, I certainly look at the, a, a different question, mm -hmm. and mine is more about where one belongs and mm -hmm. the idea of home. I, you know, it's a personal question for me because at the time I started writing River Woman, I had been living outside of Jamaica for, um, you know, close to eight years and trying to decide whether or not I wanted to remain here or if I wanted to move back to Jamaica. And I just could not uh, answer that question for myself. You know, where did I mm -hmm. belong? And, you know, certainly, you know, my family has moved, um, you know, throughout, well, some portions of my family, you know, lived in Cuba for a mm -hmm. while. And then, you know, there's a large percentage that actually lives here or has lived in England or in Canada. And, you know, the question is, you know, as a group and as a family, where is home? Where do we belong? And so that's the question that comes back to me in just about everything that I write. You know, where do my characters belong or how do they define home mm -hmm. or, you know, just the place that is theirs. Right. Thank you. Um, Donna, one of your characters, I think it's Sonia, she likes to tell stories backwards. Right. And she wants to hear the happy ending first, right. and she, in that way she subverts the plot, um, the traditional plot lines. In, right. our, in our writing classes, we teach the students about the rising action and the conflict right. and the climax and the denouement and all of that, but all of you, um, seem to have mastered the art of playing with with those uh, conventions in a way that um, we hear secrets revealed early perhaps in a way that we don't expect but yet we don't lose the element of suspense or surprise. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk a little bit about how you conceptualize plot as as a writer? Is this something that 
leads you? Is the, does the story lead you, or do you uh, follow a vision that you have? Mm -hmm. well, um, I guess I, two, two things occur to me about that. I, I mean, first, I guess I'd say that, that uh, the different elements of a story or a novel are, are interdependent, you know, so plot doesn't exist apart from character. You know, it's what, it's what those characters you have going would do. Um, and I, I think I'm a very character-driven mm. uh, writer and, and actually not one who's really big on external plot. You know, I'm much more interested in, in what's mm -hmm. going on under the surface within people, between people and, you know, and, and within people. So, you know, there's all kinds of books. I think you wouldn't probably choose or love my books if you wanted a, if you wanted a whole lot of external action, you know. No car chases. Uh, yeah, no car, no car chases. Although in, on the first page of The Serpent's Gift, someone falls from a it's window washing job. That's yeah. was, that was probably the most, <laughs> one of the most dramatic moments of the, of the book. So um, I think I've gotten interested in, in people and, um, I don't know, there have been different seeds that have, that have you know, uh, ca called me, I guess. And then, and then once, I'm, once I've imagined the characters who, who are related to that, I guess that's sort of mm -hmm. the thing that drives me, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I don't know that I... I don't know that I am masterful at all at plot, but um, but again, I guess I'm I'm interested in that that submerged thing that's going that interiority. Yeah. Right. Right. I, I, Go ahead. No, I, I guess I look at plot in a slightly in somewhat in a similar manner because um, it is the character who drives the story for me. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I did, I think, with River Woman in terms of unfolding the story was that I I used a very circular method where you know I revealed bits and pieces of it and I kept coming back and I think that helped me mm -hmm. as a writer just knowing well I needed to get to a certain place but there are bits and pieces of the story that the writer needed to know only at a certain mm -hmm. point and it's it's a very difficult thing and it changes from for every story yeah right. so you, you know even if we had some kind of nice method of looking at it now it would change the, with the formula next book. doesn't work right mm -hmm. there, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, it's true um, I think for me it always starts either with an image or a character. Mm -hmm. Every book starts with either the conception of a character mm -hmm. or, or an image. And I, I completely agree that, that plot has to flow organically from mm -hmm. character. I always tell my students that if you develop your characters so well that if you ran into them at the mall, you would say, hey, that's Joe, you know, <laughs> if you do that, they will follow the dictates of their own logic mm -hmm. and their own personality. And that then becomes the plot of a mm -hmm. story. And I'm not one uh, to outline a plot. I've never done like mm -hmm. a written outline. I just feel like, I feel like writers are enough control freaks, but you really, I mean, for a story and for an entire novel to work, mm -hmm. you have to give permission to your characters to go down, you know, mm -hmm. winding paths that you may not be aware mm -hmm. of as mm -hmm. a writer. Um, now, having said that, I am also not one of those writers who just sort of starts writing as an exercise in, you know, wordcraft um, mm -hmm. with no idea of where a story yeah. goes. I think every time I make a commitment to work on a novel, I do have some sense of what the narrative arc mm -hmm. of the story is. I have some sense of what has to happen mm -hmm. in the end. Um, uh, that's sort of the point of, of the book, if you will. Uh, but beyond that, I sort of let, you know, the forces um, <laughs> mm -hmm. act upon the book. I mean, a book has to be able to breathe on its own. You can do the breathing for a novel, mm -hmm. I think, you know. Uh, but character and, and image, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes, if you're lucky, entire phrases, you know, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, you might be asleep or you might be doing something else, washing dishes, mm -hmm. and something comes to you and you know the opening lines of your book. Mm -hmm. And then, then it, that makes it easy, you know. Yeah or easier. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I want to give an opportunity for us to hear a little bit of your prose. Um, and uh, I, um, I love to read novels because of the opportunity to have that long relationship with the characters. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to me that the novel end or, or break up with me at the right time. I want to uh, you know, feel satisfied when, when it's mm -hmm. done. And, and that, again, is, is, is a difficult art. I think a lot of beginning writers struggle with how to conclude something, how to know when something is done. And that might be a time when they turn to 
uh, a compromise or a cliche mm -hmm. or try to give the moral of the story right. at that point. So I wonder if I could ask each of you to read a little bit of something that constitutes an ending in your work and maybe we could talk a little bit about, um, you could share your thoughts on how you know when something's finished. So, um, uh, Don, um, Helen, would you? Sure. I, I think you know it's finished partly because you have to give it up to your editor. <laughs> you know? I mean, there's it's that the sort deadline. of thing. That's the tyranny of the deadline. Yeah. But, but I, um, I guess I think also you have this sense that you've brought the characters through something. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've made mm -hmm. something happen for yeah. them, you know. And yet, um, this, the, the ending that I'm going to read from my second novel, Watermarked, is um, not an ending that really resolves much. And I think mm. some, some writers felt a little, I mean, some readers felt a little frustrated by that, but I felt that that's, that's what life is like, you know. Mm -hmm. you, so I brought these two sisters who've been estranged through this process, or taken them on a journey, and what happens next is I don't know up to the up to the reader, I suppose. So so these two sisters um, reunite to in order to remake the story um, of their father, who who was presumed a suicide since they were children, mm -hmm. and they've learned that he was alive, and that instead of dying, he tried to leave them and, and his life behind. And so after they've made this journey together, one sister, Sunday, has boarded the train to return to Chicago, uh, leaving Delta in, in the town that grew them. So this is, this is the very end of, end of the book. Delta sat on the platform bench long after the train had gone. She lit a cigarette, fighting back the barren feeling in her chest that had swelled every time Sunday had ever left. She would go home and attend to a loose floorboard she'd noticed the day before, and then in a couple of days she would return to her job at the post office. Her sister was gone again, and she would have to fit together her own truths about the exploration they had made. She hadn't meant to undertake a search, but had only wanted Sunday to come home and live the return of Mercury Owens with her. And she had been pulled along by her sister's quest until they were a team. They had made some crossings and named some things. With acts of invention and remembrance, Delta and Sunday had made a different story. They had prayed. Together, the Owen sisters had chosen things that were little and big. They had found out how the time for naming had been lost and come again, and discovered enough about Mercury Owens and his weighted heart to let him rest. He had spent a lifetime on the run, transporting, despite himself, all those things he had sought to leave behind. Along with his single memento, were the judging eyes of Lomax Blunt, his abandoned wedding ring, and all the windows through which he had stood and looked. There was his desire and his solitude and shame, and a hollow where a family might have been. His past was with him, sometimes buried but never gone, and he had been marked by all of it, not least the river that had moved both ways. And like Mercury, Delta and Sunday Owens were learning that in life there may be leaving, but there is no leaving behind. Mm. Mm. Great last line. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is from Watermark. Yeah, that's what that's what. 3D? Sure. I'm not going to read the very last uh, lines uh, mm -hmm. of the book because there is the plot such as it is, does have some <laughs> element of suspense. And I, I wouldn't want to you know, be a spoiler here. Yeah, I wouldn't want to ruin that completely. But this is from the last chapter. And, um, you know, one of the two main characters, Bhima, the domestic servant, has suffered really a great betrayal. And uh, she has always found solace, and this is true for many, many people, poor people in Bombay. You know, the one great public space in Bombay is the seashore. Mm -hmm. And millions of people turn out every evening, you know. Mm -hmm. And she, she just almost subconsciously makes her way to the sea. Um, and now she finally understands what she had always observed on people's faces when they are at the seaside. Years ago, when she and Gopal used to come here, she would notice how people's faces uh, turned slightly upward when they stared at the sea, as if they were straining to see a trace of God or were hearing the silent humming of the universe. She would notice how, at the beach, people's faces became soft and wistful, reminding her of the expressions on the faces of the sweet old dogs that roam the streets of Bombay. As if they were all sniffing the salty air for transcendence, for something that would allow them to escape the familiar prisons of their own skin. 
In the temples and the shrines, their heads were bowed and their faces small, fearful and respectful, shrunk into insignificance by the ritualized chanting of the priests. But when they gazed at the sea, people held their heads up and their faces became curious and open, as if they were searching for something that linked them to the sun and the stars, looking for that something they knew would linger long after the wind had erased their footprints in the dust. Land could be bought, sold, owned, divided, claimed, trampled, and fought over. The land was stained permanently with pools of blood. It bulged and swelled under the outlines of the countless millions buried under it. But the sea was unspoiled and eternal and seemingly beyond human claim. Its waters rose and swallowed up the scarlet shame of spilled blood. The balloons were still in Bhima's hands and suddenly she imagines that their strings are all that is keeping her tied to the sad ruined earth. That if she let go her grip on the strings, she would rise and float away beyond these rocks to that narrow place where the sea meets the sky. And even as the thought enters her mind, her grip on the balloon string slackens and the footloose wind cradles the balloons and carries them away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to read a, a short um, paragraph from a short story called um, Lucky. And uh, it's a story about a woman who takes her children to Jamaica for the very first time and then sort of abandons them there. She goes missing for a few days, so they're searching for her. And then I saw my mother's orange bathing suit. She was lying at the edge of the reef, facing the water crashing violently against the rocks. There was no, te no way to tell if her eyes were staring or not. I waited a minute to slow my breathing. There was movement. She lifted a hand as if to catch a sprinkling of seawater. I thought again that it was her stillness that I had always feared. There was no more land, no place left to run. She seemed at peace as if this hard, rugged rock, and not the bottom of the sea as we had feared, was where she belonged. Lucky, I thought, born lucky. And this was the original ending of the mm -hmm. story. Um, but for some reason, it didn't quite work. So um, one of the things that I had read somewhere when I was getting ready for a class, you know, um, the writer had written that if you have a problem with the ending of your story, the problem is in the beginning. And so one of the things that I had to do was go back and I, I wrote a sort of book end, which, you know, there, there was something in the beginning and something in the end mm -hmm. that brought the story a, a, together a bit better. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I won't read that down um, those two sections, which... You know, certainly I think that for most writers mm -hmm. don't realize that, you know, they have to go back to the beginning in order to fix yeah. the end yeah. of the story. Yeah. Very good suggestion. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Good. that's so interesting. Do you, do you want to comment on that? Um, you were just getting into your process there about when there's something not working, mm -hmm. where do you look or what do you have to do um, in that sense? You know, I know when I wrote If Today Be Sweet, after the whole novel was done, there was that feeling of mm -hmm. incompletion, like some, mm -hmm. it just wasn't clicking. And so I wrote a prologue um, that's mm -hmm. written in the voice of mm -hmm. this guy who's dead, you know. And for me, it was a bit of a stretch because I don't usually, and, and the way the rest of the book is shaped, um, you never quite know whether the main character, Temina, who basically communicates with her dead husband, if this is just an expression of her grief that's making mm -hmm. her do this, or if indeed Rustam has come back as a, as a ghost, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I liked that it was ambiguous. I liked that, yeah. you know, the reader didn't quite know. And then, of course, the minute I wrote the prologue in his voice, I mean, my, I was playing my cards, or at least showing yes. my cards a little bit more. Yes. Uh, and yet, I felt like the minute I did the prologue, somehow the rest of the book came together. Mm. Mm. So, um, you know, sometimes you fix it working backwards. Right? Yeah. 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 Or we're just working over and over, you know, working yeah. it through again mm -hmm. and again, I think, until yeah. you can, because I mean, the, the problem is figuring out what the, what's wrong right? Yeah, sometimes. Right. Sometimes, yeah, you know, it isn't, yeah. I mean, is it the point of view, is it? Sure. And it's so helpful it to show it to somebody when right. you're done, you know, somebody mm -hmm. whose opinion you really trust. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my mm -hmm. last three books, I've had the same person uh, she's a writer by the name of Sarah Willis, and she has. She's a friend of mine, and she's read them for me, and you know, always come back with some great suggestions, mm -hmm. which I just almost on blind faith uh, yeah. adopt at least eighty percent of. Yeah, you know, what she says yeah. It, it's hard to see your own work. Yeah, I think. It it right. is. yeah. Mm -hmm. and it also takes yeah. time to step back from it. Exactly. I think when I sometimes I've I actually have edited 
in the book itself after it came out. Wow. Some portions of it, like when I've gone to read it, I've realized yeah. that this actually yeah. really yeah. needs to say. <laughs> needs so I can go back yeah. 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 for your own satisfaction. Yeah. yeah. Um, we just have a couple minutes left, but um, just quickly, is there anything that people sometimes don't seem to to understand or see or get about your work that surprises you? Are you surprised by the questions sometimes that you get about your work? Yes. Um, <laughs> with, with the space between us, I'm often asked, and you know, most of my readership is American, obviously, and I'm often asked, uh, or the presumption is that this is a book about caste, mm. because everybody in the West with just even a little knowledge of India sort of has heard of the caste system, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm always compelled to sort of explain that this is really a book about class differences. Yeah. And in that mm -hmm. sense, I think the themes in it are universal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could easily transpose some of these characters mm -hmm. to the U.S. Yeah. Uh, the and, Caribbean, and, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it would work in exactly the same mm -hmm. way. And these are not cultures that have a tradition of caste differences. Mm -hmm. So that's always something that takes me mm -hmm. aback a little bit. Because mm -hmm. to me, the obvious thing to look for is class differences mm -hmm. rather than caste. Mm -hmm. okay. Either of you? I, I think I'm just always surprised that people expect that it's a true story. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we live in an age where, you know, everybody's writing their memoir. And uh, I guess I'm just supposed yeah. to write reality my memoir. TV. So it's reality TV. Yes. Yes. And it isn't. It's, you know, it's fiction. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I'm surprised when people read literally what I intended figuratively. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and, and, but that's, a, that's something maybe mm -hmm. you have to, I mean, I know this from teaching, that you have to learn how to do that. You mm -hmm. have to learn how to, how to read figuratively. Yeah. So, you know, I've had people... What a story that's part of life without ends with a figurative death of a, a woman who's spent, uh, serving a life sentence for killing her battering husband. And she feels that when she tried to save her life by killing him that she died and that her, her life in prison is a kind of living death. Mm -hmm. But I've had people a ask me why I killed her off, you know, and, and, yeah. and so, so that's, I think that, you know, would be the thing across the different things mm -hmm. I've written that surprises mm -hmm. me. It's been such a pleasure to talk to all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Writing Life with writers Donna Hemmons, Thriti Umagar, and Helena Lane Lee. Thank you.